Hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar on how to build AI powered data apps using NIME. I'm Carsten and I'll guide you through the webinar today. Before we dive into the topic, let me quickly say a few words about the platform that we're using here, the streaming platform. So uh, to the right of your stream, you should see this, um, this tab where or this bar where you have a stage tab and there is a chat which you can use to talk to each other. Uh, for instance, tell us where you're um, logging in from. And there is also this Q&A button there, which brings you to the Q&A panel where you can ask questions which will be answered live during the webinar. There are a few people behind the scenes who are looking at your questions and will reply immediately. And we'll also take some of these questions into the Q&A at the end of this webinar. So. Um, Stay tuned if you're waiting for some answers. Um, and if there are any other technical problems, uh, maybe you get lost on the streaming platform, use this stage button on the left-hand side, which will bring you back to exactly where you are right now. And um, if there are some problems like the stream is laggy, maybe you, you might try using Chrome or Firefox browsers. We've seen those to work best for this for streaming. Um, refresh your browser, check your internet connection. Well, you probably uh, know the drill. Um, okay, and now let me introduce to you the people who have actually built the AI extensions in Nime. Um, I'll welcome Sarai. Hi, Sarai. Hi, everyone. And Adrian. Hello. And I'll hand over to you guys to show us the real deal. Thank you very much, Carsten. Um, we are going to go through this uh, in a kind of split fashion. I will do a lot of the presentation and slides, and so I will show you the demos. In terms of agenda, we will start with a little recap of what the NIME analytics platform is, what data apps are, and in general, what kind of software we are using for all of you that are not uh, super familiar with NIME yet. Then we will look into large language models. So um, kind of a very high level view, what they actually do um, and how you can use them. And then we'll have our first demo in the NIME analytics platform where Sarai will show you how to build a very versatile data app uh, where you can explore the possibilities of LLMs. Um, then we'll come back to a few slides on chat models and um, a little bit of a maybe demystification on that front. Um, and we will also see another demo on how to build a chat app in the NIME Analytics platform. And finally, we will talk about how to integrate your own data or very recent data with LLMs to make the most of both. Uh, and after we are done with the content, we will then have some time for question and answers. So please uh, fill up our Q&A tab so that we have very interesting questions to answer later on. All right, the NIME Analytics platform is an open source platform for data science where you don't have to code, but instead you just drag your data essentially into a workflow and connect it to multiple so-called nodes that do the data processing step by step. And you can really follow in a very intuitive way where the data goes inside of the workflow. Um, as I already said, the, the uh, essential pieces or building blocks of a workflow are the nine nodes. And nodes typically have an input where data comes in and they have outputs where data goes out to the downstream nodes. And if we combine multiple of those nodes, we end up with a workflow. These workflows can get rather big. Um, you <laughs> wouldn't believe how big some of them actually get. Uh, so it's a good practice to actually structure the workflow a little bit by combining related um, parts into so-called components. And components also come with another very useful feature. If you have some of these blue nodes, which are uh, visualizations, so for example, a scatter plot or a bar chart, then you can combine those visualizations into one um, composite view, uh, where actually these visualizations can interact with each other. And we often refer to this also as a data app um, that allows to kind of interactively explore those, um, uh, well, visualizations. And the nice thing here is that you can actually take those data apps and deploy them to a NIME hub and then send a 
a, a web link to colleagues and they can just explore this data app without ever seeing the nine workflow under the hood. Um, and what we are going to do today is build a bunch of data apps that use AI to uh, kind of give you an idea how easy it is to integrate that into your own nine workflows and data apps. Um, and the nodes that we are going to use for this uh, are the uh, are from the Nime AI extension. Um, there's also great news on this front. We just released a new version today. So as of today, we have support for Azure OpenAI nodes, which you can see here. Shout out to my colleague Roberto for this nice uh, picture he sent me like 20 minutes before the webinar. Um, and if you already have uh, the extension installed, you can you should receive an update in your 5.1.2 uh, uh, analytics platform installation. If you don't have them yet, head to hub.nime.com uh, where you can find them and download them into your analytics platform. All right, now on to large language models or LLMs for short. Uh, from kind of a 10,000 foot view, an LLM is really just a black box that gets some text as input. So for example, a, um, a prompt telling it to tell me a joke and then it produces some text output. And I really don't want to get <laughs> into the nitty gritty details of LLMs because we don't have that much time today. Uh, so we'll just leave it at that and imagine LLMs as kind of this uh, building block that we can use and feed with text and get outputs. But LLMs are not just good for jokes. They also can be used to solve real uh, text processing use cases. So some use cases you could tackle are, for example, topic extraction. And here we kind of split our prompt into two parts. One is a task description. So here, what is the topic of the following text? And then some input. And in this uh, input, I'm talking about movies. So the LLM should be able to tell me, ah, yeah, uh, the topic of this really short text, uh, admittedly, is movies. But it could just as well be a, a way larger text that we uh, put in here. And we can very easily change this behavior and the task that the LLM solves by ch switching to, um, for example, this kind of task description where we ask for sentiment. And both topic extraction and sentiment analysis are among the prime use cases for text processing and used to be quite complicated to solve because you had many steps and now it's really just so a little bit of prompt engineering, you feed it into the LLM and you get your reply. So quite powerful indeed. Um, you can also do other things like question answering. I mean, this is kind of a joke question as well, um, but you could, for example, ask for an apple pie recipe and I'm pretty sure you would get a rather decent one out of it. Or you can use it to do more creative things like getting it to write on haiku or maybe a poem, a rock song, I don't know, your motivational gym speech. I mean, you could build a data app that, that uh, <laughs> creates a, a new kind of gym motivation speech for you every morning. Um, and the nodes that we have in the Nime AI extension to kind of use those LLMs uh, in that fashion um, are shown here. So we have the OpenAI and Azure OpenAI nodes. So as I said earlier, the Azure OpenAI nodes are very new, um, but they, they work pretty well, actually, um, and they are also a little bit faster than the AI, uh, OpenAI nodes, at least that's what we found. But we also support open source models from Hugging Face Hub or even models that run locally on your machine via GPT for All. Uh, GPT for All is a, like an, um, an AI ecosystem that aims to support LLMs and other AI models running on consumer hardware. So these really run on your machine. There's no data leaving your machine, as is the case with uh, OpenAI, where you send it to some uh, endpoint in uh, in the web and get an answer uh, similar with Azure OpenAI. And the node that is used to prompt these models is the LLM prompter. And with that, I'll hand over to Sarai to show us the first demo. Hello, everyone again, and thanks, Adrian, for the introduction. Our first demo of today will be seeing how we can build a simple data app using OpenAI nodes we have. And at the end, it will look like this, where we ask um, it to create a, write a poem for us as our task description, and we want it to be about love and sunshine. And as a response, we get this poem. And let's 
jump right into how we can build such a data app. So we already prepared um, some parts of the data app, but don't worry, they will be available online. We will be focusing on the most important parts here. Which are the AI parts, right? So it's, yes, this is really exactly. the, like the general setup and layout, how it will look like in the data app. And now uh, Sarah is going to fill in the kind of the heart of the data app, which is the AI bit. Yeah, so we already entered our OpenAI API key here, and the next step will be to authenticate this key. And now we're authenticated, um, and we would like to connect the LLM model, which will be GPT 2.5 turbo instruct in this example. And we have a few parameters we can tweak here, and um, this one we will decrease it to 2,000 because this, you can also see it here that this is the maximum number of tokens to generate and we don't want our output to be cut. So we just increase it to, to 2000 tokens. And the temperature, you can also see it here what it means. Um, so the higher the value is, the, the more creative or the more randomized the output of the model is gonna be. So we will leave it at um, 0 0.2 in our example and there are more parameters then you can modify, but we're not, we won't be um, modifying those for now. And yeah, we're connected to the LLM model. And the next node will be to connect that model to our LLM prompter. But we have another input part, which will be our prompt, our user input. And if you remember it from the data app I just shown. We have a test description where we ask our model to either uh, generate a poem or do a sentiment analysis. And we have our user inputs where we give the, the example sentence or the, the topics you would like it to write a poem about. But we have to convert these inputs into a table form. And for yeah, this... That's, that's because the LLM prompter can actually um, kind of process multiple prompts at once. Um, in this case, we only have one prompt that is uh, that we generate from those inputs to the data app, but there are other use cases where you might have like multiple um, inputs that you want to produce kind of in a table format. And here, like what we now have to do is combine the prompt, um, like the user input and the task description and Sarah is doing this by like separating them with a new line character. Yep, and you can see here, now the test description and the user input are concatenated. And we feed it into our model and we should select the, the correct prompt column here and we will leave the response column name as response. And let's see what we get as a as an output. Yep, we got a poem about love and sunshine. And if you would like to see this output in the data app, uh, the, the remaining two nodes are just converting the table of into variable because we would like to see the the response in the on the screen. And we use the text bar output widget for this. So to convert this workflow into um, a data app, we have to first con, uh, create a component. Let's call it OpenAI LLM data app. And let's run it. So this should look exactly like the example we shown. Um, yeah, maybe we can ask for a different um, about a different question for a different use case. Maybe we can do a topic extraction and let's give the, the output we got from the model as, a, as our input and ask um, what is the topic of the following text. Oh. Okay, this is, <laughs> yeah. this is a very instructive response we got and 
Um, maybe maybe we can ask what is the topic of the following text in two words to see if we get a more compact response. Yeah, love and sunshine as we ask for the topic at the beginning for our poem. Um, uh, that's pretty nice. And yeah. I mean, now you could imagine we can actually play with different tasks, like run through the tasks we, that we had in the use cases earlier, or even do something else. But maybe we'll uh, leave that for you to play with uh, on your own, and we will head back to the slides um, mm -hmm. to continue with chat models. So chat models have been receiving a lot of attention, like since when uh, November, almost one year, when ChatGPT was kind of really hitting the mainstream. Um, and we are going to talk a bit about what chat models actually are, at least chat models that we have today. Um, because under the hood, they're really just LLMs that have been fine-tuned to kind of respond to this uh, uh, kind of chat conversation. Um, so they don't actually have a memory that is kind of integrated in the model, but instead they typically get the entire conversation as input so that they can reference all of the uh, uh, conversation to produce the output. So in this case, I asked uh, who won the Oscar for Best Actress, and I got my answer, and then I can just ask and Best Actor, and the model is able to infer that by and Best Actor, I mean the best, uh, the Oscar for the Best Actor in 2021 and can reply. Um, but it's not like the model really has a memory that is ingrained into the model, but instead we always send kind of the whole conversation with it. Um, and in NIME, we can also do this. So there we currently have the OpenAI, uh, OpenAI chat model connector and the Azure OpenAI chat model connector since today. Um, and those can be connected to the chat model prompter. As of now, we don't have um, open source chat model connectors yet, but Sarai is actually working on uh, implementing those for the December release. So keep your eyes peeled for those. And now um, please check out the uh, demo by Sarai where she will show you how to build a chat app using the chat model prompter. Thank you, Adrian. Um, our second demo of the day, will look like this at the end, but again, we will not um, build this workflow from scratch because there's a lot of details going on also for creating this um, chat history or the data app headers on the background, but we will again focus on the AI parts. So this time we're connecting to an Azure OpenAI model as we did in the first example and here. Um, first of all, we create the conversation table. So the memory, as Adrian mentioned, the illusion of memory we're gonna have. And we are getting our user input again through a string widget. Actually, the only thing we need here is um, prompter again, but this time a chat model prompter instead of an LLM prompter. And we connect it to, the, to our chat model that, are, that is coming from the outside of the workflow to this um, connection. And we will need to feed our conversation table or our memory as the other input part. Um, we are still missing the user input. This time we're going to pass it to a flow variable because this will be something that's going to dynamically change. And we would like to configure it to a flow variable so we don't have to manually change it or pass it all the time. Yeah, I mean, the, um, the operational mode of this chat model prompter is a little different than the LLM prompter because um, here we can only really process one conversation at a time. Um, but since this is usually done in these kind of, well, chat data app scenarios, that is perfectly fine um, and maps very well to kind of this abstraction of having this conversation and then the model answering with another um, row that is appended to that conversation. And then we write that out to the table writer so that we can read it back in in the table reader when we refresh the data app. So when we press send essentially. Yes. And this part of the workflow formatting chat history is actually coming from, again, um, our colleague Roberto's workflow. So thank you again, Roberto. Um, actually, this is this is all we need, and we can just run this 
they tap and see how it looks like. Yeah, we ask as a def as our default question on the string widget ask for the best actress that won the Academy Award in 2021, and we got this answer. And as an audience example, maybe we can ask and the best actor and see if it can infer this from our conversation earlier. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we got the correct answer for that too. But... Got the same answer as I did <laughs> for my example. <laughs> Very nice. But maybe can we ask about yeah 2023? Mm -hmm. um, be interesting to see if it's like how recent information it has. Mm -hmm. um, and we see that it doesn't have this information. And that's kind of uh, a bit of an, a problem with just using ChatGPT when it can only use its kind of... Um, memory in the sense of what it has been trained on, the kind of data it has been trained on, because the training data for ChatGPT has been cut off um, in fall of 2021. So anything that happened since then, it can't um, directly answer to, and we have to help it a little bit. Um, and that's a nice segue into the next section, where we will learn how to blend your own data or well, not necessarily your own data, but recent data with these kind of AI models to make it possible to um, also get answers for more recent events. Um, and here we are actually doing something that, or using a strategy that you probably use every day, or at least I use that mostly every day. Uh, and that is, what do I do if I don't know something? Um, I, well, honestly, right now I tend to ask ChatGPT, um, but if it's something recent, then I would ask Google, right? So if I want to know who won the Oscars, I Google, well, Oscars 2023, and I can see, um, get some some resources, a web page like Wikipedia, for example, where I can see, ah, yeah, this person won the won the Oscars. So in other words, if I don't know something, then I search for information that kind of uh, allows me to answer the question that I couldn't answer before, and we can just combine this approach with LLMs or chat models. Um, and that is then called retrieval augmented generation. Um, so here the key is actually that this can be any kind of search. Uh, we will see a specific kind of search in a, in a second, but this could also be just a keyword search. It could be a vector search. It could, like, it could be you going to the library um, when you are instructed by the model to go to the library and search out the necessary information. Um, but one kind of search that has been very popular uh, recently is semantic search with vector stores. And this is so popular because it is also based on uh, the technology of LLMs under the hood, because there's a special model used for this, or a special kind of model. And this is an embeddings model. And in contrast to uh, the LLMs we saw before, the output of such embeddings models is not a text, but instead a vector that represents the semantic of this text. If this looks complicated and dangerous because it's numbers, I promise there won't be any formulas. And there's actually a simple way of visualizing this uh, because you can um, interpret those numbers as coordinates in a vector space. Uh, so for example, here, this is just a two-dimensional space to keep things simple because it's kind of hard to <laughs> visualize high-dimensional spaces. Um, but the idea is that the embeddings model maps different documents to different points in this vector space. But if you have a good mod embeddings model, then it manages to map documents that are semantically similar to very close locations in this space. So in this case, we have some document about the Oscars and one about the Soccer World Cup. And those two topics are not super related, so they are far apart. But if we actually take a bunch of uh, uh, documents where some are more related than others, then we can see kind of the bigger picture. So in this case, I have some documents about the German Bundesliga, which is also soccer. And we can see that those are closed, closer to this um, one about the Soccer World Cup. Then we have some document about the Kansas City Chiefs winning the Super Bowl. Uh, and we have um, one about the Oscars. And we can see that the soccer ones are closer to each other than to the other things. And if we have a new document or question coming in, then we can use the embeddings model to map this document or question or also often called query into this vector space. So we get another 
point in the space, and then we can just look for the nearest neighbors in the space and fetch the corresponding documents, and we have done our, our semantic search. Um, if we want to combine that for to do retrieval augmented generation with an uh, AI, then we would, uh, instead of feeding the question directly into the AI, we would first go to our vector store to fi uh, find the most semantically similar documents and then concatenate those with the question. And then the AI is hopefully able to answer the question given the context that it has um, gotten from the vector store and then reply to our user. And to do this in NIME, we also have the corresponding nodes. So we, in terms of embeddings models, we again have models from OpenAI and Azure OpenAI, but we also have connectors for and connector for the embeddings models on Hugging Face Hub. And um, there's also light on uh, at the end of the tunnel in December. We will also have a, a embeddings model from GPT for all that runs locally on your machine. Um, in terms of vector stores, we currently support Chroma and FICE or FACE uh, vector stores. And we have the vector store retriever node, which does this uh, semantic search uh, that I talked about earlier. And yeah, we also have the text embedder if you want to get those numbers that uh, I, I showed you earlier, which can be used for clustering, for example, or for visualization also. Can be can be quite useful for some use cases. And with that, I'll hand over again to Sarai to see how to implement retrieval augmented generation in the NIME Analytics platform. Thank you, Adrian. Um, in this example, we're going to use the workflow we just used for our second demo, but integrate the, the vector store and the retrieval augmented generation on top of it. So what we have to do, first, we need to create our vector store, and we scraped more recent data from Wikipedia and already prepared it. It is the data is not in a perfect condition, so we'll see if uh, if um, our chat model is going to be able to retrieve the information we would like it to retrieve. So to create a vector store, first we need to connect to um, our embeddings model, and for this we will use Azure OpenAI embeddings connector. And here, uh, it's important if you use Azure OpenAI, then you need to talk to whoever is kind of administrating the um, Azure OpenAI side of things and deploys the model so that you can get the deployment names uh, because there we currently can't yet fetch all the models that you have access to. But that's also something we are, we are actually working on. Yeah, and now we create a vector store, which fortunately is pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And we would like to use it later, so we pass it to our component. And the next step would be to retrieve the, the most similar documents to our input, to our user input, to our question. And for this, we have a vector store retriever node. And we would like to pass our user input or question to the second input node, input port. And since we need um, the data in a table format again, we first have to convert our user input to a table row, as you can see down here. And we would like to pass it to our vector store. Our query is selected as our, our user input and number of results. Um, it depends on the application or how many most similar documents you would like to get. We will increase it to five, for example, and need the column name as default. And similar to the LLM prompt, uh, the vector store retriever can actually do this fetching for like all of the rows in the input table. So not just one document, but like a bunch of documents if that is uh, necessary for your use case. Um, in this case, we again have only one because we're in this kind of chat uh, scenario, um, but there are other cases where it could be quite useful to be able to do that for multiple rows at once. And here we're using the same function again, but this time two times because you will see later in the in the chat window 
So this part actually just separates the retrieved documents by two new col new um, new lines instead of one, and the outer function combines the retrieved documents, added two new lines, and our user input. And let's um, call this new column user input with context. Yeah, and I mean, this is essentially the, the plus that was in my kind of high level description earlier, where we combine the context with the question. And let's see how that works out. And instead of our just the user input, this time we would like to pass our user input combined with context. That's why we would need to change the flow variable to the new flow variable as our chat message. And here this time, we would again um, give the model to a definition of how it should behave or a persona. Yeah, or also kind of guidelines, so you can tell it to be funny, to talk like a pirate, to be respectful, uh, non-offensive, and so on and so forth. So there's like a lot of ways in which you can instruct the model using the system message uh, to behave in a certain way. Actually, that's, that is all. And the output we would get this time look looks like this. So these are the, the documents we retrieved and our question and our, hmm. Okay, so okay, in this case, we probably need to do a little bit of uh, prompt engineering. Um, so one, one thing we would want to do is actually not show all of the context to the user here. So we mm -hmm. will, will hide that, um, mm -hmm. but maybe let's first instruct the model to really uh, use the context given because sometimes um, if you don't, like really point it to or shove it to do something, it might opt to not do it. Um, so in this case, we can just ask it to answer the questions using the context. Uh, please use the... Yeah, hopefully this time. It will answer the question. Huh. Uh, oh, 2021, maybe you change it to 2023. <laughs> ah, true, yeah, sorry. Our context is actually, it provides more recent information, which actually includes in terms of academy awards, um, only 2023. And finally, it can answer the question. Can we now quickly also remove the context so yeah. that it looks a bit more concise? Okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then we will just it. use the string replacer, right? Um, mm -hmm. To kind of uh, replace our qu uh, input that has also the context with um, the original user question because uh, the user wants to probably not see all of the context that is going, or all of the things that go on behind the scenes, although it can be useful for debugging purposes um, to see that. Because in this case, for example, we could check the context and see, ah, oh, no, the information is actually in there. So something must mm -hmm. be wrong. So that works. So maybe we can also ask for best picture yeah. and see if that also works. And uh, yeah, that also works nice. Cool. Um, mind you, this is not just something you can do with uh, information about the Oscars, but really with any kind of documents that you might have available. Um, it could be news articles, it could be your internal documentation. Um, if you saw our Nine um, AI Assistant, that one actually uses something very similar like this under the hood as well. Um, and with that, let's uh, move back to the slides because we have one more little announcement to make. And that is that there will be uh, learnathons for 
the NIME AI extension or, uh, or the NIME AI learnathons by our colleague Paolo. Um, they will take place in November and December in Hamburg, Nottingham, and Berlin. So if you are close to those cities, um, consider checking it out. It's a very nice experience being kind of in in the um, uh, in the meetup uh, and having kind of someone instruct you hands on how to build those workflows. It's much easier than following along in this kind of webinar format that we have right now. And uh, Paolo is also a very good teacher at uh, getting people to really uh, get the most out of NIME for their own use cases. And with that, we would switch to the Q&A part of the webinar. Hello, yes, and there I am again. Welcome back. Very cool, thank you very much for showing, um, showing all these demos and introducing all these notes. I uh, bet this will be very helpful for a lot of people to solve their own uh, use cases, AI use cases easily in NIME. Um, so maybe let's get started uh, by, I think you mentioned it here and there that all the all the demos that you were showing were using um, were using the open AI or Azure open AI nodes, which means the data that you were uh, or the questions that you were asking were being sent to uh, a server and the response is coming back. Is all of that working also with offline models already? That I you were building these things. <laughs> yes, I, I can say a few words about. <laughs> This. Um, so for the first example, we already have appropriate nodes for that. So for LLMs, it is possible to use offline models, but they will be a lot slower than the models from OpenAI, unfortunately. But for simple, not simple, but for tasks like sentiment analysis, it should be okay. It maybe requires a little bit of prompt engineering. Um, for the chat model examples, it's not possible at the moment, but um, I mean, it it is, it will be possible and you can already try it out um, in the nightly and um, as as well as our um, offline embeddings model is a, will be available at 5.2 with the chat model connector. So yeah, feel free to try it out in the nightly build. Yeah, I mean, the, the second um, demo with the chat app, that, that you could actually build uh, with the um, GPT for all LLM, but you would have to be a, do a bit of uh, kind of formatting of the prompt because if you use something like Llama 2, it will behave very strangely if you're not prompting it essential, uh, in, in the exact format it expects. So it expects this conversation format that I showed you. And if you just like the LLM prompt or really just hands the text that you put into the node to the model and that doesn't tend does, that does not tend to work very well with those models. At least that's our experience. And we are working on providing kind of uh, chat model connectors that do all of this um, formatting for you if you're using a chat model under the hood. Okay, so you're saying the uh, if you use offline models or other models than ChatGPT, then uh, you on the one hand need to change the prompts a little bit depending on the model that you're using and the quality might not be as good. Yeah, that's at least our experience so far. Yeah. And you are kind of bound to your hardware limits. I mean, the idea of GPT for all is really to make these models accessible to uh, consumer hardware, but then they also run on, on consumer hardware and that is just not as fast as the high-end mm -hmm. servers that OpenAI and Azure um, are using. Yeah, sure. And uh, maybe somebody asked, uh, which which is then if you want to use the high quality models from OpenAI or via Azure, then somebody asked how you can generate the credentials. But I guess <laughs> this is not a question how we generate them. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, in that case, it depends like which um, API you want to use. If you want to use OpenAI, then you can go to openai.com and sign up there and generate an API key. I believe you get like five dollars of free credit um, that you can use, but you also have quite severe rate limits if you're using that. Um, so unfortunately, there, that is not completely free to use. Uh, it's for Azure OpenAI. Um, you really need kind of a um, setup, like an Azure setup with your company, 
but actually many companies seem to have that. At least we had quite a few requests for those nodes. Um, uh, in, and in terms, uh, in case of Hugging Face Hub, you can sign up for free, but they have a policy where um, you can use the like this online inference, but well, very deprioritized. So it, those calls tend to take a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, we are working on actually getting this GPT for all stuff ready to also be used with chat models. And then uh, you are bound by your hardware, not necessarily by uh, <laughs> waiting. And you can then then you can actually run it offline on your machine, and it's kind of for free, uh, except mm -hmm. for the electricity costs that you incur. Okay, and while we're at these uh, OpenAI ChatGPT services, um, I've seen the question. I mean, this is this has been the point of discussion quite a while. It's like, what are the the security or the actually the privacy uh, trade offs you have to do? Can you maybe briefly outline what it means to use either use OpenAI directly, use Azure, versus uh, maybe Hugging Face as well, and then versus running it locally? Yeah. Um... For OpenAI, they have a policy where they promise to not use the data uh, that you send to them via the API for any training, uh, but they are obliged obliged to um, store it for 30 days or something like that. You can, uh, if you have an account, maybe via an organization, you can kind of fill out a form to request um, none like no retention of data at all. That works for some models and it doesn't work for others. Uh, the exact details um, you would best look up on their website. Uh, they they pointed out there. Um, in terms of Azure OpenAI, they are also not using it for training and there you can more easily say, okay, I don't want to, any data retention at all, for example. Um, so many companies actually prefer Azure OpenAI especially if they're already on Azure anyway, uh, because you can then set up like a private link that never leaves the Azure backbone. So it's not going through any um, kind of outside servers of the internet, but is within all of the servers of, um, of Azure uh, and it's considered to be most secure. Uh, but it's, I guess it's the, the general uh, privacy of cloud applications that you can expect essentially and hugging face there uh well if you run it on hugging face hub itself then i'm you're also exposing your data to them they say they don't use it but uh yeah it, you always have to trust them basically so okay. yeah <laughs> yeah it's kind of a trade-off that you have to make mm -hmm. unfortunately and that then also depends on what kind of data you're working with and what your company policies are and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and another difference between those models maybe, or general, uh, somebody asked um, what document formats or well, which size length is accepted. And this, this is also different per model and, and what you're running, right? So they, they all have this context uh, with context size. Yes, um, I mean, for the GPT 3.5 uh, family of models, they typically have 4,000 tokens that they accept. Um, a token is roughly three quarters of an English word. Um, <laughs> it depends a bit on what you put in there. If it's, for example, JSON, then uh, it's uh, fewer characters than when it's actually natural language, like a news article or something like that. Um, for the vector stores, they don't really care. Uh, they can store way bigger um, sizes. Uh, the question there is really the embeddings model. And the one that we used here, which is this uh, the most widely used um, embeddings model from OpenAI, uh, I think that one has 8K context size. So that actually is bigger than what you can put into uh, GPT 3.5. It's roughly the size of what you can put into into GPT-4 if you have access, um, but then you have no space for output left. So the embeddings model is actually not the bottleneck. Typically, it's one of the, uh, like the, the chat model or LM that you use, because especially the open source ones um, that run on local on a local machine, I think those are at like 2,000 tokens or something like that right now. Mm 
but mm -hmm. I, I might be wrong on that one. Um, okay. Thank you. Mm, another question that was coming is, uh, can this be used for data, for numerical data, for structured data? And uh, that you, you already pointed to at that, right? So JSON is a form of structured data. Um, yes, uh, numerical data, I would separate from that. I mean, if your JSON yeah. contains numerical data, uh, yeah, that's uh, fair enough. So what we actually have been using it for is f for kind of structuring, like putting natural language into a structured form, like JSON, for example. And that works to, uh, tends to work pretty well. So JSON, uh, structured data like JSON works well. Numerical data, I'm not so sure of because it's not like uh, the, the training data was really mostly like natural language and a lot of structured data as well and um, programming code. Not so much just numbers. Um, there, I would be a little bit surprised if that worked super well. So for example, we also um, struggled in some use cases where we wanted it to kind of output uh, text that didn't exceed a certain number of words, for example, and that counting is was at least in our experience not necessarily the strongest uh, um, suit of of those models. <laughs> it's a language model, not a number model, after yeah. all. Right? <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Uh, somebody else asked, can we use different large language models like Llama with Nime and uh, yes. <laughs> you already um, said that, basically. Right? Yeah, so with the GPT for all connector, you can already connect to a uh, offline version of Llama that runs on your machine. Um, you can download it from the GPT for all website and connect to that. There, just a disclaimer, that one is very sensitive to the input format. So if you get a weird output that typically starts with Unterscheidung, um, like a German <laughs> word for <laughs> difference um, that you can like you can use that one um, just have to make sure you you format your input correctly but we're working on also having a chat model connector that does uh, takes care of that task for you um, if you have uh, deployed a um, text like there is this server um, or it's not a service, it's kind of a project by Hugging Face, um, what they call a text gen inference server. And they have, for example, Llama models as um, that you can kind of download in a Docker image and deploy them as a service. And we also have a node to connect to this kind of service and speak with that. There, the same uh, issue would probably apply with this text uh, formatting. And there we are, again, are working on a chat model variant that takes care of that for you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have two questions here that are going in the same direction. One is how do you retrain the models as new data arrives? And the other is, are you planning to make notes for fine tuning? So let me split this into two parts because I mean, what you have right now, Sarai, what you showed right in the demo, we had the a vector store that contains some kind of information that in this case about the, about the Oscars. Um, this one you can update and always use the latest set of information that you provide, right? Yeah, but I do not think it's called retraining the, the model, but it's providing maybe more information that is available for the model to retrieve information from. Yeah, but I guess in, in many cases this is I could imagine at least that this is a, a use case that comes very often where you mm -hmm. basically want to retrieve, you provide your, well, you want to check with something that has access to a, a knowledge base that is updated all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what you can do with these vector stores, right? And then to go really to retraining, well, most people would not have the data to train their own LLM completely, but to, for fine tuning this, Adrian, maybe you can glimpse at what's it might be coming. Yeah, um, that's something that we do want to investigate. So we can, um, you can already fine tune models on uh, OpenAI. 
Um, there is a Python API for that. I think there actually exists also uh, some community contribution um, that wraps this OpenAI API and has some fine tuning features. So if you already did kind of the fine tuning, you can already use the fine tuned models with the OpenAI connectors. So that's like uh, one I would like to make. Uh, but we also want to um, provide nodes to do fine tuning. Uh, we'll start with the OpenAI ones. Um, because there you have, we have an API and we can kind of outsource the like the resource intensive task of doing the actual fine tuning. Um, because at least on consumer hardware, fine, even fine tuning those models will be a very tedious uh, task and long running. Um, so we will first explore this kind of uh, API based one um, and then also look in the other ones. Um, Maybe one note on this kind of retraining with recent data. Uh, you already kind of point in that direction uh, that this part is really what you can do very well with this retrieval augmented generation. And the fine tuning is less about getting necessarily new information into the model. But I think uh, we will see in the future, or we're already seeing that right now, that the, the value of fine tuning is actually teaching the models new skills. Like, um, for example, you could teach a model to be super good at creating SQL queries or super good at building workflows or super good at writing Python code um, and kind of fine tune them to, to be very uh, very good experts in one particular task. And then you could actually combine multiple of those models in your NIME workflow to solve all of this these different tasks and orchestrate everything in the NIME AI extension. I think that's really really powerful um, once we actually grasp uh, all the possibilities that are there. And that's why uh, for the Llama family of models, there are already the specialized code version, the specialized yeah. Python version and so on coming up, which will help with exactly that specialization. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because OpenAI had the same kind of fan out. They had like, a, a, I think it was codex, something like that. And then they had different models for like certain texts then for conversation and so on and so forth. And now they actually have kind of a fan in where they have one chat model and one instruction model. <laughs> uh, so they have actually fewer models now, but they actually still promote their fine tuning um, for, for customers so that they can actually fine tune it to their specific tasks because this like the general, the uh, general purpose models are good enough at at many tasks already, and um, those fine like they couldn't fine tune these other models uh, um, enough to be. Uh, yeah, they had to walk kind of the tightrope between being somewhat general, so that they are applicable for many use cases and specific at the same time. And there's kind of a trade-off. Um, and now they kind of went more to the, towards the generalist models and provide you with the ability to do fine tuning for your specific use case, which mm -hmm. is something we are also very um, hopeful about for our own um, AI based uh, features for the NIME analytics platform and maybe hub as well in the future. This is maybe just a good, yeah, I wanted to ask about this anyways. I mean, you've shown the, the nodes now with which our Users, everybody can build their own AI powered workflows. But we also have this AI integration in NIME now, this chatbot that you can ask questions. Is this kind of the same thing behind the scenes? Uh, yes and no. Um, it builds on the same technology under the hood. So the AI extension and the NIME AI assistant both built on the Python library Langchain um, to do, uh, to reach out to the different um, integrations. I mean, okay, the NIME system is based on OpenAI, um, although we are also considering switching to Azure uh, very soon because we found Azure to be faster, at least in our experiments. Um, <clears throat> but the, it's not like the um, server running behind the NIME AI system is written in, uh, it's, it's just a workflow. Well, at least not yet, maybe one day. But you can, you could build this kind of um, assistant using a workflow. And in fact, we're actually using it, or at least I'm using it to prototype uh, new features for the NIME AI assistant. 
and see how I can, uh, we, how I have to do the prompt engineering to get the desired output because I find it a lot more intuitive to do this kind of orchestration of AI um, calls in a nine workflow compared to a Python script or Python program because it's easy to see the connection between different parts of the system mm -hmm. and how the data flows through the system, which can yeah. s like save you a lot of time. <laughs> At least that's my experience, which, but I might again, be a little bit biased as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which again shows the power of visual programming and being able to look at intermediate results. Yeah. Um, nice. Um, okay, we have time for maybe two more questions and then end the session. There is uh, another question about, can I build the UI? Uh, using another technology, like for instance, ASP.NET and use the NIME AI model behind that. And Ooh. I guess, I mean, I, NIME has so many different features to offer. It can also build a REST API, right? And then you can build a, a website yeah. and that talks behind the scenes to a REST API, which is then powered by a workflow like that I have shown. Yes, yes. That uh, would absolutely work. And in fact, that's also something we have been talking uh, about to some colleagues internally as well um, for a different use case. Uh, but that should absolutely work because in the end, the uh, what you do is you do this kind of orchestration. And if you expose your workflow as a REST endpoint via the NIME hub, then um, kind of anyone can connect to it with, for example, a POST or GET request uh, and kind of get the result back um, and then you mm -hmm. could have a website that does that absolutely or some mobile app. Um, I think in the past we already had customers who kind of had um, an app and the back end was actually running on a uh, NIME server back then. Uh, but now it would run on, on, on a NIME hub uh, and uh, kind of the all the processing would happen in NIME and then they would have the app as kind of front end which could be pretty powerful. We haven't tried it yet with the um, AI extension, but I actually don't see why it shouldn't work, to be honest. Nice. And the last question, maybe, and I think we've already touched on that, but is it the use to analyze customer verbatim or technical comments on repair orders by feeding the text data into the model? And uh yes that, <laughs> it's similar to what the demo has done just with a different topic right yeah i mean we do know of um at least one customer who used this already in a poc to analyze forum data um may, maybe a slightly different modality but maybe closer than than what we did so that worked pretty well and our colleague jose was very shocked when he tried it out with the ai extension because he spent a lot of time building text processing and it, it didn't work super well and then he tried the um AI extension kind of pretty much worked out of the box um mm -hmm. so that's absolutely possible it really depends on kind of what you want to do and maybe how you can break down this task because uh, what we found in many cases is that it is better to kind of take your overall tasks, split it up in subtasks and see where you need the flexibility of those um, generative AI models and where you can actually do most of the work with like conventional means, um, maybe like a string matching or something like that, and then combine the results to get the best output. Because those models, like, yes, you can ask ChatGPT a question, it will give you an answer, but you, you can't really tell very well how it got to that answer. And in fact, it might give you a different answer tomorrow. So uh, there it's a bit important to kind of try and kind of guardrail the models uh, and make sure that they behave the way you expect them to behave and that you can actually detect when, when they go kind of off the rails. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we've touched on uh, before in that regard is probably also it, it kind of depends on the sensitivity of the uh the customer data that you're that you have whether you are <laughs> legally allowed to send that to open ai or not and uh or whether you want to keep that in-house yeah um, that's true yeah good okay thank you very much guys for answering all these questions 
I think we have like one more slide at the end. Yes, I would show. Ex Are you have more slides as well? Okay. No, no. Um, I, I think it might be the same one. Yeah, yeah I was one. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was. I was about to get there now. So, uh, yeah. If you like this, uh, then drop us a review and on Trustradius, share your experience. And uh, as always. Um, you can stay in touch with us, uh, find all the notes that we've been, we showed uh, on the Nime Hub, and also just get in touch on the forum via LinkedIn, watch our tutorials on the Nime TV YouTube channel, or contact us via the, uh, this button on the left-hand side of, your, of the streaming platform. And yes, thanks for staying with us. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.